So I love you to be out here at Betty's Bay on, on such a glorious day. If you brought a Bible with you or you have access to one, you may want to open up to Luke chapter 1. We're going to be reading from Luke chapter 1, and it is of course a very appropriate passage to be reading in the lead up to Christmas. It's a passage about two people who are about to become parents for the first time. The parents-to-be that we will read about are very different. The first is an elderly man. And he's long since given up on the idea of ever having a family. The other is a young woman. And uh, she is very much looking forward to having a family. The people that I'm talking about are Zachariah and Mary. Zachariah became John the Baptist's father, and of course Mary, the mother of Jesus. Here's their story, Luke chapter 1 verse 5. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well along in years. So this sets the scene for what's to come. This is the backstory. At that time, not being able to have children was widely viewed as, as a failure to fulfill the creation mandate, to be fruitful and to multiply. The lack of children would have been a big issue in Zechariah's life and in that of his family. But I believe it's something he would have come to to have come to terms with by this time in his life. The supernatural aspect of John the Baptist's birth is alluded to here. We're told that Elizabeth was barren. We're told that they were both well advanced past the age of childbearing. And perhaps some would have regarded their childlessness as an indication of an absence of God's blessing. But Luke assures us that this is a God-fearing couple. Look at verse 6 again. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. Who can you say that of? This is a healthy reminder to us that physical blessings are not a, an evidence of God's favor or lack thereof in our lives. Let's continue the story, verse 8. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty, he was serving as priest before God. He was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time came for the burning of incense, all the assembled worshippers were praying outside. So this is a special moment. Zechariah's the chosen one. They threw the lot. It landed on. He's got the top job that day. Verse 11. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. Nobody told him that might happen. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel said, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. And you are to give him the name John. Can you imagine this? After all the years of praying, desperately praying for a child, doing all that you can, Perhaps 40 years later, out of the blue, you're told, your prayer's been heard. 
Does anybody here know what it's like to wait 40 years for God to answer a prayer of yours? Perhaps a lifelong prayer. It's a, a commentary on how prayer can work in the economy of God. You pray and you pray and you pray and you pray, and then decades later, God says your prayer has been answered. So be encouraged by that if you're praying for someone. This must have been a lot for Zechariah to process. Imagine being told in your latter years you're about to have a, a baby. It's a shock. But the angel continues, verse 14. He will be a joy and a delight to you. And many will rejoice because of his birth. And he will be great in the sight of the Lord. What wonderful news. Children really can be a delight to their parents, but you never know what you're getting. This is good news to be told. Your child, he's going to be a joy and a delight, and, and he's going to be great in the sight of God. All Christian parents want their children to, to serve and love the Lord. That's the goal. So be to, to be told by an angel that your child is, is going to serve the Lord and impact the world. What wonderful news. Now the angel Gabriel goes on to describe the kind of life that John must live and will live. Verse 15. He's never to take wine. Or other fermented drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many of the people of Israel he will bring back to the Lord their God. He will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. To turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. And the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. And to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. What a wonderful thing to be told. Your son, he's going to be set apart for God in a special way. That not drinking alcohol is very similar to that of the Nazarite vow, which was a particular lifestyle of holiness that some devout people adopted. Zechariah is told, your son is going to be filled with the Holy Spirit from birth. You'll recall that later in this chapter, in verse 39 onwards, when Elizabeth went to visit Mary, or the other way around, Mary goes to visit Elizabeth, John the Baptist leaps in her womb, and Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit, and Elizabeth says, Why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. By the way, this is why we know that abortion is the taking of a human life. These two babies, children, John and Jesus, in their mother's womb, they had a unique relationship with God. And they're able to sense and feel and process information. They have an identity. John in his mother's womb leaps for joy as Mary and Jesus come into his presence for the first time. But back to verse 17, Zechariah is told, Your son will go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. What an amazing promise to be given. And this is where the, wheel, the wheels now come off for our friend Elijah. Eli is Zechariah. <laughs> because Zechariah is about to demonstrate for us the wrong way to respond to God when he speaks to you. Verse 18, Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? How can I be sure of this? 
And the angel says, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words which will come true at the proper time. I imagine that this rebuke from the angel would have somewhat detracted from Zachariah's joy. Although he's being described as, a, as an obedient and blameless man, there are immediate consequences for Zachariah's lack of faith. Imagine being given such an amazing prophecy as the one we looked at, and then not being able to talk about it. He can't say, Elizabeth, have I got news for you? He can't say, our prayers have been answered, we're having a boy. His life's going to change the nation. He can't speak. This reminds me of when God struck Paul with blindness for three days on the Damascus Road. I think he was giving Paul a chance to process what he'd experienced. This muteness will now last for nine months. Zechariah has come under the discipline of the Lord. He's been silenced. And I'm sure it was also God's way of giving him some time out to prepare for raising John. The people were waiting for Zechariah, verse 21, and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. Maybe he passed out in the shop, who knows. When he came out, he could not speak. He kept making signs, but remained unable to speak. And when his time of service was complete, he went home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. And so ends the section on Zechariah. Let's consider soon-to-be parent number two, Mary. Verse 26. Once again, it's Gabriel who shows up. Verse 27. He appears to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Mary was probably 12 or 13 years of age. Her life just unfolding as she'd hoped it would. A kind-hearted man, Joseph, has recently asked her to marry him, and she said yes. Joseph's a descendant of David. She's marrying into a good family. Everybody in the community is looking forward to the wedding. Unlike Zechariah, Mary is not a priest. She's just going about her, her normal everyday life. Verse 28, Gabriel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said, verse 30, don't be afraid, Mary, you found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son and you're to give him the name Jesus. By the way, Mary and Zechariah both had this in common. They didn't have to figure out a name for their children. <laughs> The angel goes on. Your son, he will be great. 
He will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. As they say these days, let that sink in. Can you imagine Mary processing this? Remember, she's about to get married to Joseph, and now she hears this news. But it must have been wonderful to be told, you found favor with God, you're going to have a child. The name Jesus is the Hebrew word Joshua, which means the Lord saves. And he's going to be on his father's, David's throne. David was the greatest king Israel ever had. And Mary's told her son is going to be a greater king, greater power, greater authority, greater spiritual significance. And notice how Mary responds to Gabriel. It's very different to Zechariah. She says, how will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. Zechariah's response was, how can I be sure of this? Mary's response is, but how will this be? Zechariah is reprimanded for his lack of faith. But Mary's genuine question is, is answered. The angel says, verse 25, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. And here's another amazing response from Mary. May it be to me as you have said. That's a faith response. And in the Hebrew language, that's like saying, Amen. May it be, as you have said. In this next part of the sermon, I want us to compare how Zechariah and Mary respond to the word of God that comes their way. There are many similarities. Neither Neither of them are expecting God to speak to them. They're both visited by Gabriel. They're both commended for their faith and their godliness. They're both told something utterly impossible. But they respond differently. Zechariah is skeptical. Mary is full of faith. We know that Zechariah's response was not neutral. This is not a, an innocent misunderstanding. Oh, there, Gabriel just thought that you know, he was expressing doubt. This is not as the politicians would say, misspeaking. No, Zechariah is wrong. He's morally wrong in the way he responds to the word of God in his life. That's why his ability to speak for nine months is taken from him. Remember the angel, and now you will be silent and not able to speak because you did not believe my words. You know, if we, if we didn't know how the story played out, and we were given two characters to assess, Zechariah and all his attributes, and Mary and all of her attributes. And we were asked the question, which of these two do you think would respond positively to God? Well, Zechariah has walked with God all of his life. Mary was a, a child a, a couple of months ago. Zechariah is a priest, the son of Aaron. He spent years studying the Torah. He's in 
full-time ministry. He's on duty, serving before the altar. They both receive a, an identical revelation from God. But the one disbelieves and the other believes. Reminds me of that very first sin in the Garden of Eden. Where the question is asked, did God really say? Both Zechariah and Mary have questions. And we do have questions when it comes to matters of faith. And questions are fine. God answers her questions. Neither Zechariah nor Mary have proof that what's been told to them is so. But Mary chooses to believe. I want to make this clear because it's sometimes a matter of confusion for people. But doubting and believing are choices that we make. They are not just automated responses. Remember Jesus' words to Thomas, who unfortunately got the name Doubting Thomas, though he had plenty of faith. Jesus says to him in the upper room when he's expressing his doubts, he says to him, stop doubting and believe. There are two actions there when it comes to responding to God's word. Stop doubting. That's something you do. Otherwise, Jesus wouldn't have told him to do it. Stop doubting and believe. That's also something we do. I'm reminded of the man in Mark chapter 9 who's also wrestling with faith and questions about a sick child and says to Jesus, I do believe, but help my unbelief. We can have faith in the presence of doubt. Mary shows that they are stronger. Let's see how these two stories play out as we wrap up this message. Verse 59. On the eighth day they came to circumcise the child. This is Zechariah we're talking about. And they're going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no, he is to be called John. And they said, but there's nobody in your family called John. Then they made signs to Zechariah to find out what, what he wants his child to be called. And they bring a writing tablet. And to everybody's astonishment, verse 63, he wrote, his name is John. And at that point, he could speak. Then as he finished writing John, he could say, John! <laughs> and he was free. He obeyed God. It followed through. The neighbors, verse 65, were filled with awe. And everybody was talking about these things. Everybody heard about this and said, What then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. And then Zechariah launches into this amazing prophecy about his son. Which is not surprising given he's had nine months to think about it. And get his act together. We re he's even now filled with the Holy Spirit. Which perhaps makes a change for him. He was in ministry by the way. But he wasn't filled with the Spirit. Back in the day. But now he is. Verse 67. His father Zechariah. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Prophesied. Praise be to the Lord. The God of Israel. Because he has come and redeemed his people. You can read the whole prophecy, verses 68 to 75. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip to verse 76. This is the father speaking about his newborn son. You will be called a prophet of the Most High. You will go before the Lord and give his people the knowledge of salvation. 
Verse 80, the child grew and became strong in spirit. And he lived in the desert until he came to address Israel. And let's see how Mary's story unfolds. I've already read the verses about how John the Baptist is visited by Jesus. I want you to notice what, what Elizabeth says. In a loud voice he proclaimed about Mary. Bless, this is verse 42. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child that you will bear. And here's what's interesting. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord will come to me? It's quite astounding that Auntie Elizabeth refers to Mary, her niece, as the mother of my Lord and Master. These are unusual words to come out of the mouth of a conservative, devout, monotheistic Jewish woman. How blessed I am that the mother of my Lord has come to visit me. And now it's Mary's turn to prophesy, and you're familiar with this. And Mary said, verse 46, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for He has been mindful of my humble estate. From now all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. And you can read the rest of her prophetic song. What a wonderful story this is. Christmas is about God surprising people with His goodness. Showing up to those who least expect Him. It's a message of joy and salvation. It's got everything in it. Surprise, intrigue, shock, the reversal of fortune. A man who believes his bride has been unfaithful to him, only to discover she's blessed beyond measure. We even have tragedy in the Christmas story. Because of Jesus' circumcision, Simeon or Anna, one of the two I forget, tells Mary in a soul and a sword to pierce your own soul too. Friends, how are we going to respond to the Word of God as it comes to us? How are we going to respond to the Christmas story? Are we going to respond like Zechariah did with skepticism, doubt, and hesitation? Or are we going to respond to what God is doing in our lives like Mary did with a submissive heart saying, May it be to me as you have said. Let's pray together. Lord, there's so much we can learn from these two people, Zechariah and Mary. We see how you work through ordinary people. And we see how you come and surprise people and, and answer prayers years after they've been prayed. And our heart's prayer today, Lord, is that we would be people who have faith. Even though we have questions, may, may we not be those who are skeptical and full of doubt and err on the side of not believing and sometimes thinking we're so clever in the process. Help us, Lord, to... Be like Mary, to be responsive to you, 
open to change, open to your plan and will for our lives. And thank you most of all, Lord, for sending Jesus the one who makes all things possible and the one who makes it possible for us to be highly favored in your sight thank you for the gift of righteousness that we receive from Jesus we receive that gift and we worship you today with heart full of gratitude and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.